Hello everyone and welcome to episode 4 of the History Hotline. My name is Deanna Lynn Cook and today's episode is called Educationally Subnormal. In Britain in the 1960s, the government opened up ESN schools, educationally subnormal schools. And these were for children um, defined as being ESN, educationally subnormal. Now, just as, as a disclaimer, you know, referring to any human being, person, child or otherwise as educationally subnormal is absolutely abhorrent. And any time I use that term throughout this podcast, it is me merely quoting and not, you know, insinuating that anyone is educationally subnormal. Um, I'm going to read you the the dictionary, the government definition from the Ministry of Education of an ESN child. And it goes as follows. A child who, by reason of limited ability or other conditions resulting in educational retardation, requires some specialised form of education wholly or partly in substitution for the educational education normally given in ordinary schools. Here we have then two groups of children, the former of which provides the population of the ESN schools. The backwardness of the ESN special school child is, however, in most cases, well seasoned with other conditions referred to in the definition, i.e. late entry to school, irregular attendance, truancy, ill health, overindulgence or irresponsibility on the part of the parents, frequent changes to the school due to changes of address, disharmony amongst between school and home, keeping of late hours, psychological maladjustment, and finally but not least, faults within the educational system, i.e. large classes, bad building, unsuitable curricula or unsuitable teaching methods. No child is classed as ESN unless he is so retarded that his standard of work is below that achieved by average children 20% younger than himself. The children admitted to the ESN schools are, however, much more seriously retarded. As you can probably tell, there are so many issues with that definition of a child, a human being, retarded being one of the main ones, um, and the language used to describe a child that may have had special educational needs, um, may have had a tumultuous home life, may have had, you know, maybe a lot of movement um, from area to area and maybe struggled to keep up with the curriculum and, you know, hence was scoring quite lower average-wise than people younger than themselves. This was a... I, I want to use the word interesting, but I don't think interesting is the correct word to use in terms of this definition because, obviously, it wouldn't pass by today's standards of how we talk about people and what terms are used and what terms are acceptable. However, the the definition is interesting because of the things picked out that defines a child as being in need of a special educational school Um, and defining them as educationally subnormal, and we'll get on to why that is so interesting shortly. In 1971, a man called Winston Bernard Card wrote a book called How the West Indian Child is Made Educationally Subnormal in the British Schooling System. And this book was published for specifically for black parents, um, Caribbean parents, parents of West Indian children, who were now navigating the school system in the 1960s and 70s. Now, as you know from previous episodes, if you've listened to the Mangrove 9 episodes, that it was in the post-war era that the majority of Caribbean um, migrants came over and they were tasked with, you know, kind of finding their place in society, navigating um, the spaces, and whilst it was mostly men that came in the time directly after World War II, so 1948 onwards. By the time we got to the 50s and 60s, women started coming over independently um, and as, you know, part of families, as well as young children. And obviously these young children would need schools. um, And in some cases, these young children had been separated from their parents, they had been left behind with grandparents or aunties or older siblings in the Caribbean islands and then their parents had sent for them when the time was right and when they'd found a place to live and so there was um, a kind of separation um, in some cases uh, where parents may not have known their child as well as you know they would have had they all stayed together as a family and things like this these little changes these shifts these movements you know literally from one side of the world to the next um, allowed the schooling system to take advantage I would say of Caribbean parents and their children and to put them in these educationally subnormal schools. Bernard Quart as he's known in 
the publication of the book, although his first name is Winston, was uh, part of the Grenadian Revolution, actually. Um, he was from Gren- Grenada. The Gre- Grenadian Revolution happened after the the book was published. Um, and he came over as an educator. He'd studied his master's in the UK and he was tasked with visiting some of the ESN schools to teach in. Um, he was a teacher in some of them. And in an interview, he said that he was alarmed at the high proportion of West Indian children that he saw. He said that sometimes there would be a school where a third of the children were West Indian, whereas in that area, only 9 to 10% of the population was West Indian. One or two of the schools he went to, he said, had about 60% West Indian children in it. And in again, the population of West Indian people was only around you know 10%. In other cases, it's been reported that around 70% of the population of some of these ESN schools were filled with West Indian children. And I wonder if anyone can tell me why that might be. Anybody said institutional racism, then I am telling you once again, you are correct. Academic and activist Anne Dummett wrote in 1969 in the publication Race Today that the main problem they face, and by they she means uh, black children in schools, is the attitude of their school staff, of the white contemporaries, of other children's parents, and of course, of the whole society around them, the attitude that regards them as different and inferior. It's clear that it was the case that despite what any black child may have done in any given situation, they were perceived as inferior from the get-go. And so these ESN schools was the only place that teachers, educators, authorities felt was the right place to send them. And this is where we begin to see problems with, especially within the Caribbean community and trusting the school system. And these problems have exacerbated and I think they've continued on today. If we think of PRUS, uh, pupil referral units, um, which is where children get sent to if they cannot uh, function properly in mainstream education, they are overpopulated by young black children. Black boys are the most expelled group of children within schooling today. These are issues that haven't just, you know, happened overnight. These are a result of systemic racism, of policies against black people that are heading all the way back to when black people and black children first entered the schooling system in the 1950s and 60s. Before I go off on an actual rant, I'm going to take it back to Bernard Cord's book, um, How the West Indian Child is Made Educationally Subnormal in the British Schooling System, again published in 1971. So just in time for kind of influx of children going into the schooling system again um, after the 60s where the first wave of children would have entered education. Now, he describes these ESN schools as an abysmal failure of black children within the system. Racist policies and practices of the educational authorities of that period. He said there was racism in the curriculum, poor self-image, poor self-esteem and self-belief in reading materials, low teacher expectations and inadequate black parental knowledge and involvement in what was happening in the schools, as well as a core black parental organisation to tackle these issues um, and a lack of black teachers. He felt that all of these things exacerbated the problem and it made it even worse and it led to more children being sent to educationally subnormal schools. And I would like to say, we'll get onto it later, but over time, um, things called supplementary schools were set up, Saturday schools, and parental organisations came together like the Black Parents Movement and small community-based activism groups came together to fight this issue and they successfully did so and they managed to get the um, government much later on to kind of reform these policies and to change them a little bit and with the inclusion of more teachers um, kind of making their way into the education system, uh, more black teachers, more teachers that were aware of the struggles of working class people because it wasn't just black children that were getting thrown into these schools, it was white working class people as well because um, their children you know, may not have had the most stability at home, for example. But all of these things shouldn't really mean that you're just thrown into um, an ESN school. And I think it's it's definitely a sign of the times. I think there's a lot more support within education now. I'd, I'd like to think, anyway, I'm not a teacher, so if there are any teachers listening, I'm sorry if I'm wrong. But at that time, they were just dumping grounds. And uh, Bernard describes them as dumping grounds for black kids. They were before they were called ESNs, they were called MSNs, uh, not the social media site, but mentally subnormal schools, which I don't know. I don't know what's worse, really. Um, But they were 
especially populated with not just obviously West Indian people, but West Indian children that pa- their parents had maybe left them at home and they had joined their parents uh, later on. And so that kind of gap, as I mentioned before, the gap between the f- formative years of the child growing, they hadn't had their parents by them. Maybe they'd had one parent or maybe they'd had neither and they'd been raised by grandparents. And then they'd moved to England, moved to this cold country, this new country, without their friends, without the people that had raised them in their most important years. And I think the dissonance between parents and children has exacerbated this problem because if a teacher then comes up to you to to talk about your child that you barely know and tell you that your child is misbehaving, your child is, I don't know, fighting, is not picking up the work very easily, what can you really say? Because you don't really know your child that well. Um, And so there were a lot of problems. There was a lot of, I assume, a lot of emotional trauma between parents and children. Um, But these things would not have been helped by putting a child in an ESN school. And Bernard Code, he worked in an ESN school and understood what went on there. And he didn't really believe in them. He didn't believe that they were doing anything positive for any of the children that went there. They were just a dumping ground to so that mainstream teachers could get on with teaching everybody else and these children would be forgotten. So regarding the publication by Bernard Cord. Um, He was given an internal Inner London Education Authority, the ILEA, a report. He was given a report from those people um, on all the ESN schools in the jurisdiction, so in London. And someone within the kind of authority had had enough um, and wanted to expose the report to the public um, and decided that they had to get it into the right hands. Um, So they got it to Bernard. And he had the personal experience and obviously now he had this report, the hard evidence um, of what was going on. Um, And he said, just as I was stumped for an answer, I went to a party one Saturday night thrown by six Grenadian friends of mine who shared a house in Tulse Hill. At this party, there were West Indians from all the islands. They had been living in Britain for many years and had children in the school system. And they had been hearing rumours, as they put it to me, of what was happening in the schools, especially the ESN ones. More than one came up to me and said something like, we hear you're a teacher. Um, And he said there were a precious few black teachers in those days in the ESN schools. We are hearing all kinds of things. What's really happening there? And I think he probably alluded to maybe some of the things he'd read in the report. And they asked him to write a paper and present it at a conference that was happening soon. And he did. And at the end of it, he was basically ordered to turn this paper into a book. And he was given a deadline of three months and it was in his summer holidays um, of his uh, university course that he took those three months to write that book because everybody was so anxious to have that scandal exposed in the shortest possible time. Because as you can imagine, their children's education was on the line. And I don't know if you if you have any siblings or children yourself um, in education right now. And, the, you know, the few months that education went a bit topsy turvy because of coronavirus. Um, the amount that children were reported to have potentially fallen back and the amount of money that's now going into schools to try and close that gap up. Can you imagine if a child was just left in an ESN school where they weren't really being supported very well um, or given opportunities to catch back up with mainstream? This could be absolutely fatal, and it was for so many black children in the 60s and 70s. So he was tasked with writing this book and he decided to address the book directly to the black parents, not to teachers, not to the authorities, not to the education boards um, and not to pupils, which obviously would be a bit of a strange choice, but to the parents. And I think this is quite interesting because, first of all, it meant it was written as an accessible text. Um, Academics absolutely love and adore to use absolutely huge words and convoluted concepts that I just used a a big word there. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. But, you know, big words, big concepts, uh, lots of theory that people don't really understand. And that's kind of why I guess I'm here doing this podcast, as opposed to writing articles that will sit on a website that nobody will read because they can't understand. And this is obviously what, you know, Bernard Codd was thinking of doing. um, Firstly, maybe writing for the academics or writing for uh, people like teachers or the political elites that were running this kind of thing but he decided no he was going to write for the um, black parents who you know may have not been in England for so long may have been in England for 20-30 years at that point it was the 70s uh, by then and he decided he would also keep the publishing within the black community 
because he didn't want it to get edited. He didn't want it to get watered down. Um, and he wanted it to be accessible. He wanted these parents to understand what was happening to their children and what they needed to do to stop it or to help them. Now, he published with New Beacon Books, um, which was a publishing house by John LaRose, um, big community activist, had hit, had the first, one of the first uh, black publishing houses in London. And Jessica Eric and Eric Huntley, he was also supported by them. Again, they had Bogle Overture Books, another publishing house in London, uh, one of the first black ones. And he was also supported by other community activists and novelists. And again, just like the Manga of Nine episodes, this sense of community, the sense of urgency, the sense of rallying behind someone that is going to, you know, push this truth out in order to help all these black parents across London and across the UK. I think it's so important to remember how big community was and how successful black people were when they navigated the community properly. Now, of course, you know, with every... With every type of activism that people try and do in this British country, there is always a pushback. There is always a problem. So we're going to get into the problems. But first of all, talk about how it got publicised. Now, this publishing run was it was mega, especially for, you know, a short little pamphlet style book for black parents. And it was sold quite cheaply as well, just to make sure that everybody could access it that needed it. Um, but thankfully, uh, Bernard Cord, he was very, very, very well connected man. He knew journalists and um, editors of big publications in America, in the UK. And he said, with the help of the right publishers, um, this story made it onto the BBC. And it was wrote about in written about, sorry, um, in many big publications. And it began to get some traction. And with this traction, obviously, came the threat of violence from none other than the London Metropolitan Police. Of course, they had to feature. They feature everywhere where there is negativity. So there were threats from the police, of course. Um, the establishment's reaction was, he said, big brother-like. And the first night of publication, um, Bernard Cord's phone was tapped. And his wife and himself were followed uh, by security personnel, he assumed. And on one occasion, his 11-year-old nephew, who was spending the holidays with him, was harassed by the police in a police car, uh, very close to where they lived. And his nephew was threatened with a trumped-up charge. <laughs> An 11-year-old was threatened with a charge. And uh, the sergeant, whilst, you know, not, um, stating this charge to this 11-year-old boy, was looking straight at Bernard and kind of seen, like to kind of gauge his reaction um, and to kind of send this message of like, you know, if you think you can do this, if you think you're a tough guy, we can pick on your 11-year-old nephew to kind of get you to do what we want you to do. And six months after publication, um, he said the education establishment backed down on its campaign of the vilification of the book. His phone stopped being tapped, his wife, his nephew and himself stopped being followed and there were no further threats. So I don't know what the turnaround necessarily was in those six months, but there was one. Thankfully, the threats to him and his family stopped. And to me, it's absolutely berserk that a man that was trying to help, you know, black people have their children not be thrown into these educational subnormal schools because their children, no child is educationally subnormal, let alone, you know, these children who might have had a whole host of issues or no issues at all because it wasn't even a thing of, you know, oh, every child was disruptive or every child was noisy. Sometimes just by the fact that a child was black and as a black child they were perceived to be inferior, it was suggested that they would not achieve much in life even though their parents had literally moved them across the world for a better life, for better educational opportunities and to get better jobs in the future. However, these teachers at the time, these educational authorities did not believe that black children would um, amount to anything and so they thought why waste the time let's just put them in these schools um, and get them out of our hair as a result of the book thankfully parents started to mobilize as i said before there was a black parents movement and they started to meet up and down the country and black supplementary schools were formed black youth groups were formed and the ones that already existed started up the conversations of the scandal and began to obviously implement educational extras um, within these youth groups to support children um, so that they could still achieve the things that they needed to achieve despite the fact that they were being discriminated against in schools. And 
This book, obviously written and intended for black parents in the black community, it really took on a life of its own. It influenced white teachers, um, students, university students, journalists, trade union leaders and, you know, progressive members of society and the majority of the population. It mobilised them as well to kind of seek change. I think that's quite important. Not everything can be done by the black community alone. Um, Allies are needed. And in this case, with other people supporting the cause, um, these developments they forced a rethink and radical adjustment was ha- was um, enacted when it came to the establishment um they conceded they surrendered and whilst they are s- technically still denying black children equal and high quality education you know we all saw the education um the a-level and gcse scandal um it was a certain demographic of children that were all doing very well and getting grades higher than they were predicted because they went to specific schools in specific area codes um And then there were children that were in maybe schools that hadn't historically done very well who were getting worse results than they were um, predicted. So we've seen it. You know, the education system, it's not a fair system. It's not a racially just system. And there is bias there. And these biases are and have been disproportionately impacting black children from the 1960s. I wanted to speak specifically on one of the responses to the scandal breaking and teachers and parents finding out about what was happening in ESN schools and speak about supplementary schools and Saturday schools. Now I went to a a supplementary school um, as a young child and you might be thinking why did you go to a supplementary school? Things had changed by the 90s. Um, Actually I went to school in the 2000s, I'm not that old. Um, But I went to a Saturday school and today before recording this podcast I asked my mum why she sent me to a Saturday school as opposed to just leaving me um in mainstream education and that being my only form of education so I went to primary school Monday to Friday like everybody else but on Saturday mornings um I went to Saturday school and all my cousins went as well and my brother and a lot of our family friends their children went too and I asked my mum before and she said that she wasn't satisfied necessarily with the primary school education and knowing um the how the system is set up she didn't feel like or she didn't want to risk the chance that I might not be, you know, properly educationally stimulated in school. Um, my mum worked at a Saturday school before having me and she saw the work that they were doing in the community and she wanted me to be part of that as well. Um, she also said, she said a lot, <laughs> she said that um, at my primary school all the teachers were white and she didn't want me to just be educated by white teachers and only see at the educational people in my life and the educational authority in my life as only white people and it is interesting I went to a Saturday school and it was run by black people and they are the only black teachers I've ever had and my mum's a teacher my nan's a teacher my aunt's teachers my cousins are teachers I've never had a black teacher apart from in that Saturday school in that supplementary school and another reason she said she sent me is because she wanted me to understand the value of working independently um and so not just working you know in the time that is allotted to to be in school Monday to Friday um she wanted me to see the value in you know picking up work on a Saturday because that will better you as a person and it's a great habit you know here we are now recording a podcast about history um on a Sunday evening and so yeah I went to a Saturday school and if in my memory I went in during primary school I didn't go during secondary school but I remember learning about black history there and I remember doing extra maths and extra English and I think all those things have helped me you know to where I am now the only black people I learned about in school were enslaved black people when I went to Saturday school I learned about kings and queens in Africa I remember my teacher specifically he was Nigerian and he taught me about Nigeria before colonization and I don't know if that had an impact on me studying black history now and being so interested in it but if I had left primary school with no education of black historical figures or topics and gone through most of secondary school only really learning about Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela you know by the time I get to university um, and pick history then I think it is it would be quite strange if that hadn't had an impact on me because it's the thing I was drawn to and it's the thing I wanted to learn most about black history. I am you know eternally grateful for that Saturday school that I went to Uh, that was run literally in my local community and I know that Akala who wrote Natives he went to a Saturday school as well and speaks on his experience there a lot in his um, book and also in interviews and it was clear that these schools were doing a lot of good in the community I don't know many supplementary schools that are still around today I know there are some but I don't know where they are Um, but it's clear that this country was not and is not equipped properly to teach 
black children or chooses not to be um, at this point. And so that supplementary school, it taught me a lot of the things that I would not get out of the curriculum. And thankfully, that tradition was started, you know, by the fact that this book was written. But I think the lasting and damaging impact of, you know, this relationship between some black families, some black communities and education, it's it's quite tumultuous now. I think that it would be a bit ridiculous to maybe think that seeing and being part of a school system that has clearly rejected black people, you know, there's obviously going to be some anti-school sentiment within, pe- within people within the black community. This relationship's been damaged by systemic racism, by government policy, uh, just like the p- relationship with the police, you know, in the wake of the Mangrove Nine, and obviously many, many events that happened before the Mangrove Nine. Um, but, you know, just drawing on the par- parallel of government systems, systems that are in place, you know, that people pay their taxes for, that are, su- are supposed to educate and create a new generation um, of young people, failing them. And I think this has impacted black Caribbean people more so than maybe um, people from African countries who came in the late 90s um, and early 2000s because by then, obviously, we've said the policy had changed. Um, And whilst, you know, Caribbean people had put in that work to better the school system, the sentiments of knowing that this system was not designed for you, it had rejected you, and it was in place to kind of ensure your failure, it's a difficult question to ask, but if you were put in that situation would you attempt to override that or would you maybe give up and take a different path in life that didn't rely on an education? But then within the society we're living in now, we don't really have that luxury because education is clearly so important for so many professions. I think even something like an apprenticeship, you need to have GCSEs to do so. And so if the system that you directly need and is going to be have a direct impact on the trajectory of your life is not there for you, there's clearly a massive problem and it needs massive reform. Whilst the school system, the education system has clearly come a long way, it's clear that there is still definitely work to be done, especially when it comes to the education of young black children and whether that you think that means, you know, more black teachers are needed, more black senior leaders are needed within school systems, more black people are needed in policy making, um, or if we don't necessarily need black people, we just need people that understand the needs of a variety of children as opposed to just uh, one type of child. I think also, you know, the points about the curriculum and the fact that supplementary schools are free to obviously teach what they like. They are an addition and not the mainstream. Um, But, you know, these questions right now that we're going through in the wake of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement with the education system and the curriculum and what should be taught and what should be included and whether or not, you know, there's enough history of other cultures do we need more black history well obviously you know I love my black history and I think we definitely need more of it there are so many topics that I have for the upcoming weeks that I am aware I've never been taught in school so you know why would anybody else have been taught them in school I think that that would alleviate some of the problems regarding self-image and self-esteem and self-belief I feel that if you can see yourself represented positively in in your education, in your everyday um, environment, then you are much more likely to be successful because you can see what that looks like. You can see that success, you know, in your everyday consciousness. I think that is everything we have time for today. Um, so that is me rounding off on educationally subnormal schools. I hope the country's rounded off on them forever. I hope we never, ever hear about them ever again in any way, shape or form. Um, Thank you all for listening so much. We'll be back next week with another episode of the History Hotline. Have a wonderful week. Goodbye.